Welcome to this uh, amazing event that we are hosting today. We're very excited. Um, this is the keynote uh, lecture presentation. It's a joint uh, sponsored event between the IWA uh, Christine Fallon Prize and the AAD College DEI. This is a lot of letters. Um, and uh, so we, we, this is part of the um, IAWA symposium that we host every year. If you don't know the IAWA, it's the International Archive of Women in Architecture. It's an amazing uh, archive um, that seeks to collect and preserve the, the professional papers of women in architecture throughout history and throughout the world. Um, it's a very precious and unique archive. It's the only one of its type in the world, and it's here on campus. It's part of special collections in, in Newman Library. So if you haven't had the chance to visit it or see the work, just make sure you don't graduate without having ever visited the archive, because it's wonderful. Um, this is a year of many transitions. Professor Donna Dene, um has retired this year. She was the chair of the IWA for 30 years. And we are very grateful for her amazing leadership of the IWA for all these years. Um, um, next year, 2025, marks the 40th anniversary of the IWA, and we will be creating initiatives and organizing and hosting multiple events, so please stay tuned and, and participate. Uh, come, come and participate and celebrate with us. Um, to complete the symposium events today and tomorrow, well, today we have this uh, presentation, this conversation. Tomorrow at 1.30 in the A Architecture and Art um, Library in First Floor Kogel, there's gonna be a presentation by um, Rebecca Edmonds, and at three uh, in the afternoon in the lobby in Kogel, I will be giving the gallery talk to talk about the exhibit that's in place there now, the one by one Argentina. But uh, today we are delighted to host the recipient of the 2024 Christine Fallon Prize uh, and learn about her awarded uh, manuscript. The, um, the prize, the Christine Fallon Prize, is generally endowed by Christine Fallon, who is here with us today. Christine is a VT alumna. She's a long-term advisor of the IWA and has worked in large firms in Chicago before starting her own practice. Within that context, she envisioned the, um, the prize. And the goal of this prize is to bring to light women architects practicing in large firms in the 20th century. Uh, in the second half of the 20th century. It's an important stratum within the broader mission of unredacting women from history. So I would like to introduce you first to Christine Fallon. I'm going to, st I'm going to stand up here because I'm very short. And I'm delighted to be here today, and particularly because we have such an extraordinary presentation today. You know, my, my dear mentor and friend, Milka Blitznikoff, envisioned um, the IAWA um, in response to her question. She was teaching architectural history, and she went to the dean and said, why are there no women covered in our curriculum of architectural history? And the dean said to her, well, there aren't any. And, you know, Milka goes, whoops, you know, <laughs> wrong answer. And um, so she set out to prove him wrong uh, very effectively. And um, so, you know, today's prize, and uh, it's, it's wonderful, really brings to light an extraordinary body of work by a brilliant woman architect. Um, not because she's a woman, but because... She needs to be included in the history of architecture. And I want to really congratulate Rebecca Edmonds for this marvelous piece of work. Thank you very much. I also want to say thank you to um, everyone who submitted for the prize and also for the jury who took the time to evaluate the uh, submissions. So thank you. So, I think I'm running out of 
Um, okay, so today's event, as I was mentioned before, is co-sponsored by the IWA Christine Fallon Prize and AADDEI, uh, and we're celebrating the second recipient of this prestigious prize, Rebecca Edmonds, who studied the long and prolific career of Alison Williams. Um, so a brief introduction to Rebecca. She's a licensed architect, has devoted her career to helping architects internationally create professional narratives on design, leadership, and technical performance. She conducts research into evolving design issues for health and wellness, sustainability and resiliency, education, and urban development. Edmonds received an undergraduate design degree from Cornell University, an architectural master's degree from the University of North Carolina, Charlotte, and an MFA in creative writing from Queens University. She's the author of Designing Words, Writing Basics for Architects, Artists, and Designers, and Architect Plus Action Equal Result, a guidebook to AIA Fellowship, The Professional Narrative, and Defining Means in Practice. So please help me welcome Rebecca Edmonds, who will introduce now our guest. Thank you. I'm going to stand for a minute, just a minute, because I don't usually read, but because this brilliant woman beside me, this person beside me, it's a lot to cover, so I had to write it down. But first, I just have to thank Donna Dene, who tapped me on the arm at an AI event in Washington, D.C., and said, you should do this. You're a writer. You should submit for this prize. And then also to Christine Fallon, who, first of all, if you want to look into women of the second half of the 20th century, you can't help but find her name, particularly when it comes to the technology in this field. So we have to thank her for that tremendous contribution and her tremendous career, but also for being a benefactor of this terrific prize. And both of them essentially sent me on this wild nine-month journey that is culminating in this moment here and uh, involved this brilliant human being beside me. So like I said, there's a lot going on. So I got to read it. Sorry, I don't usually read. Allison Grace Williams, FAA, amassed an international portfolio of large-scale civic, cultural, and research work as a design leader at SOM, Perkins and Will, and AECOM from the late 1970s to around 2016. She founded AGWMS Studio in 2017 as a platform con for conceptual design, consulting, academic engagement, design competitions, design juries, and pro bono activities. Respected for her inventive instincts and design leadership, Williams Architecture Bridges culture, technology, and the environment, and always creates a narrative on the values and traditions of people and place. And she started doing this in 1970, right? Mid-1970s. She is an adjunct lecturer. Sorry, my dad was a broadcaster, so, you know, there's some animated. I try to not let you go to sleep. Uh, we've never presented before, by the way. <laughs> she is an adjunct lecturer in architecture at Stanford University. Stanford University's new Dura School of Sustainability has thrice chaired Harvard Graduate School of Design's visiting committee and was the 2021 Asherick Distinguished, Distinguished Visiting Professor at UC Berkeley's College of Environmental Design. Williams' jury involvement includes the Coat Top 10 Design Awards and numerous state and national AI design award juries. She was selected and served on the 2021 20 to 2023 AI Jury of Fellows, which means she was part of selecting those the highest end, uh, the upper tier of the profession in the AIA for their contributions to society. She was appointed to the Design Advisory Council to select the architect for the new Global War on Terrorism Memorial on the Mall in DC. See why I needed a piece of paper? Williams holds an MR from UC Berkeley's College of Environmental Design, a BA in the Practice of Architecture, uh, of Art, excuse me, Practice of Art, also from 
Berkeley. She was a Loeb Fellow at Harvard's GSD. And she was elevated to the College of Fellows relatively early in her career in 1997. And I believe she was only the third woman to be elevated. So. Of color. Of color, sorry. Black, actually. Yes. <laughs> there were, but there were no other, there were actually no other women of color as a fellow. You Is were that black. true? Yes, that's oh, true. Oh, no, really? Oh, that's bad. I'm sorry. Sometimes my data gets in the way. Uh, <laughs> She also received the AIA California Council's Norma Skerlick Award in Architecture. In 2023, as all, you all now know, Allison became my subject for my research manuscript, Allison G. Williams, an architect first. And I'm just... <laughs> I'm making her laugh. I think that yeah. would be good. We've been involved for... Many months in very intense conversations. And we, we, yeah, I was just going to say this is the moment that I get to, to thank Rebecca for choosing me because the interesting thing is at this point in my career, so many of my peers who had the guts to go out and form their own firms like 40 years ago or more, you know, they're all trying to figure out, okay, what now? You know, they're trying to retire. Do they close the office? Do they... Uh, have they been on a path to identify the next layer of leadership, the next tier of leadership, so they can back off gracefully and only be involved in what they want to do? Or, you know, do they go, like, cold turkey, just done? Um, and I don't know how you stop doing this. And for me, um, I stopped. And my friends started uh, doing books to commemorate their their careers. They call them vanity books, most of them. It's not a bad thing, but at a moment you just stop and you collect it and it becomes the foundation or the finish line or whatever you want to call it. And there comes Rebecca. <laughs> and who knew that she would, for me, kind of create that place where I finally feel satisfied that somebody has taken the thread and laced it all together, you know, in a way that, first of all, I didn't have to do it myself. It's not done through the lens of my own opinion of myself. Um, she's been in corners of my drawers that nobody else has been. And I say that, you know, that we've had some funny, embarrassing, you know, you know, come down to the reality of stuff. She shared a lot with me, but I think I shared more. Um, and we're the, the research <laughs> subject, <laughs> right. so we're clear. But the really great, great thing is that I'm very proud of her for doing this. She's, she's, she's crafty and she's good at her craft. She's not only a good writer, but she's thread together. Um, my interviews, which I don't know how many of them there were, 10 maybe, yeah. you know, done all by Zoom um, with maybe 10 or 12 people. She started with a list of people, and all these people were not necessarily my friends. You know, they, they were people with whom I'd worked, where it had ended not so well, you know, people who I've always respected. But she interviewed them, and she found the sweet spot where she could extract what she needed. And then she wove these things together with my work and my conversations and, you know, things that she'd read found online and it's just it's I haven't had the ability to read all the way through it yet. I, I, I maybe can read it for 20 minutes and then it's just too much <laughs> but there's some good stuff there and I feel like for me it's closure that um, satisfies that need to kind of I never felt like I needed to let everybody know what I did because I've lived kind of not in a spotlight but just my own personal satisfaction of knowing that it exists somewhere. So. so I have to first tell you all how Allison and I met. I was actually the editor for a book that's called Managing Design, and it's with conversations with architects and uh, others across the design and construction industry by Michael Fever. A great book if you want to understand sort of and hear firsthand uh, the, the thoughts and speaking and interviews with professionals across the country who have done this work. But when we, for some reason, he asked me to be on the interview with uh, Allison for the book, and uh, she just was like, all right, time out, and this was all on the phone. We didn't, we didn't do Zoom, this was pre-COVID, so 
Who knew Zoom? Um, and she was like, time out. I don't want to be interviewed as a black architect. I don't want to be interviewed as a woman architect. I want to be interviewed as a design architect. That's why I'm here. And I think that, you know, was for both Michael and I, it was a little readjustment, I'll be honest. And we went right forward. And we went forward with the interview that Allison wanted to do. And at that moment, I, that, that statement just stayed with me. Because I'm a second career architecture person. I came from um, textile and apparel design for highly technical applications. And in all that work that I did, I never thought of myself as a woman doing that work. So who was I to put that lens onto Allison and then the lens of race as well? So when Donna tapped me on the arm at this AIADC event and told me about Christine Fallon and the prize, um, there was only one name that came to mind, and that was Allison Williams. So I was so, and I got her, I sent her a message through LinkedIn. I didn't have her email. And, you know, it was weeks, and I thought, oh, she's not going to want to do this or whatever. And uh, then I got this LinkedIn message back. I don't look at LinkedIn often. Let's talk. And so that has led us to here. So I think we're just going to walk through some, talk through some parts of the book, some parts of her career that I learned about that I think would be really great to share with you all. I'm going to start a slideshow. Um, behind us, I'm going to just start it here, that's going to roll through her work. We'll be talking about these, this, some of this work and points in her career, but it, we will, I'll stop the slide at one point so we can get into her new work. But all the work that we're talking about is just going to run past us. So we might stop it on a project here and there. So I'm just trusting that this will start the slideshow, right? Will it move forward on its own? We're all yeah. in an experiment here. Yes. OK, great. So you began your professional career at MBT Associates in California. And you told me this great story um, about Gerald McHugh. I have to look because I can't remember anybody's first name or last name, for that matter. Um, you told me a great story, what it was like to be there, and about how that design studio worked. And I thought it would be really wonderful if you could share that story with this group. Yeah, I mean, Jerry McHugh uh, went on to become the dean at Harvard in the late 70s. Uh, I graduated in 76. There was no work, but I was lucky enough to get a job at Jerry's office along with his partners. That firm had been as big as 140, and it shrunk down because of the recession. And as work started coming back in, it became very apparent that Jerry's attitude was about a, a level table. You know, you get a new commission, you invite everybody, no matter what their level is, and you talk about ideas. And everyone's kind of responsible if they're in the room to come up with an idea. And this was for the Chevron headquarters in Concord, California. And everybody did a scheme. It had an alphabetical um, uh, kind of uh, letter attached to it. And after 45 minutes or so, everyone pins up their stuff, and we critique all the stuff, and there are 10 or however many things on the wall. And things got edited and edited and edited. And so finally, I think mine was Scheme J um, on the wall, was still on the wall, and ended up being the foundation of the scenario that became the party for that project, which actually did get built. Now, it was probably a little idiot souvent stuff because I didn't really know what I was doing. But there was something about the armature that was clear and um, graphically legible and ordered. And, 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 and finally, I learned how to make it a scheme. I don't think I would have known how to make it a scheme, but Jerry knew how to make it a scheme. And the people more senior than I knew how to make it a scheme. So I think a lot of what I learned in that three and a half years that I was there, not only did I get my license, uh, before I went to Skidmore, I already had my license. Uh, I learned how to work with other people, how to learn with other to other people. There was often a structural engineer in the room. You know, that whole notion about program and um, designing from the inside out was all part of, it was just there. And then going to Berkeley, which it's very different than going to a lot of other Ivy League, I should say, 
different than going to Ivy League schools because Berkeley was not that. And it was really a forerunner in um, performative design and social factors and things like that. They were just laced in. They were not, for me, I didn't see them as separate things. They were laced into what you were supposed to be learning and listening to. So that was a great foundation for licensure. Well, and while you were in your graduate program, you were tapped to, you applied for and got a fellowship at SOM. Right. Um, so you were an intern there and got to know all these very now famous places. But M while at MBT, you got tapped. Yeah. Someone called you from SOM. Yeah, and in my, um, I think, third year at MBT, I did get a call from Richard Foster at SOM. <laughs> in, uh, you might recognize some of these names, Christine. Um, uh, he had been there when I did my uh, internship, and then he called me. He still knew where I, he could find me, and he said, you know, we have an opening. It was really, it was hard to leave MBT, but it was the right thing for me to do, and I went there not thinking I'd be there for 18 years, but lo and behold, <laughs> yeah. So the high-rise 88 Kearney, which is in the, was in the early slides that you saw, was the first a design project you led at SOM. And it was also the first break from the modernist canons that were present, especially at SOM at that time. Um, you want to tell the group a little bit about your approach to that project? Sure, sure. I mean, it's always, as anyone who's worked in a big office, you know, you, you got to be honest. You don't do anything by yourself. So I certainly had a team. It was... Um, Chuck Bassett, who for me was just everything, um, who was the partner in charge in the San Francisco office at the time. Um, there were a lot of restrictions on what you could and couldn't build in downtown San Francisco, still are. Um, this building sits on a corner in a historic district, and it became about um, how to mark a corner in a precinct. And certainly you could do a flat iron kind of thing or, you know, you could do a turret. And the notion of doing a turret is particularly part of the San Francisco architectural Victorian style. And so it became all about the fascination with designing this dowel on a 23-story building that when you stand in the turret, you can actually look out of the window and see the face of the building beyond. And, you know, it faces west and north and south, actually, technically, and it's protected. Nothing's going to get built to block those views because it overlooks a historic area. And um, in the design of it, it became all about shade and shadow, and I was just fascinated. There are like four inches of relief in the wall from the outermost surface to the back surface, and it's made out of, it's in precast concrete panels with um, inlaid ceramic tile. And um, that's also kind of a historic um, terracotta in San Francisco is, is normal in that historic district. I remember going to the Heathware factory, if you've ever heard of Heathware dishes. You know, I went to the Heathware factory and those blue tiles are Heath tiles on there. I've had people say it, and I, I used to, I still do feel a little annoyed when people say it feels very feminine. Yeah. You know, and, and in fact, it it's is. Round it. It's round, but it's also <laughs> lacy. It's, it's kind of when the sun hits it and it's white. It just, it just comes alive. So um, I, really, you know, I feel myself in that project. And it, it was the first that I'd say I certainly worked with other talented people, but it finally became mine to shepherd and, and learn from. So a lot of the buildings that you did in your career were kind of firsts in a lot of ways. And the Library of Virginia would have been won by SOMDC, their office. And Craig Hartman, who had been the, the um, two, have I got that right? I was missing, one of my interviewees has an H-A-R, the two of them have H-A-R in their last names, so I get a little confused. But anyway, it came from SOM's DC office with him, and he was moved to San Francisco when DC was closed. And the Library of Virginia was actually the first very important project. He had to bring it with him, he, but they made him interview again because the building was like, you know, 
his office was 90 minutes away and suddenly 3,000 miles away. So he had to re-interview it. And he selected Allison to work with him on that project. And it was considered a very important project at SOM at that time because they had done most of their work was this corporate headquarters type, an office tower type of building. They were not known for cultural project. So you want to talk a little bit about your contributions because he really spoke strongly about Allison making a tremendous difference on that project. Well, this is what's interesting about these interviews because I don't think Craig ever said that to me. <laughs> so, you know, the point is, I didn't know why it was important for me to be involved in that project. I, I hadn't done a library before, but I think that there was always maybe something about the way I worked and the way I, I communicated ideas um, that made Craig and me very different, overlapping certainly, we're the same age, you know, overlapping, but, you know, I was established in the San Francisco office and he needed, in, in order to demonstrate to the Library of Virginia client that he was coming to a place where he had, where there's some depth of bench, you know, someone who could, um, who could bridge the, the gap. Um, but from very early on, I mean, we worked very closely together. We went through a lot of different schemes. And what shows up real quickly um, when you're working with other people and, and you respect them, certainly, but you may be coming from opposite sides of the way to think about the solution to the problem. And I think this solution to the Library of Virginia is very solid, you know, stately thing that I don't think Craig and I disagreed on. But when you get down into the details, what, what, are, what, is the, what is the kind of language of this partie? You know, is it lacy? Is it metal? Is it, um, is it tall? Is it, is it um, historic in the East Coast frame of, of reference? You know, and so that's where we had a problem. You know, it's Jeffersonian. What does that mean? You know, and being from the West Coast, it just couldn't mean columns and stuff. So there, that, I think the, the way that Craig and I got to know each other and respect each other was over that conversation about how do you make something Jeffersonian, it's spatial, it's detail, you know, it's volume, it's, is it layers or is it a volume? Really fun stuff. <laughs> Your last uh, SOM project was the San Francisco International <laughs> Airport, which was also super important for SOM at the time because of what was going on in the economy. So it was a really important project in that firm and in, particularly in the San Francisco office. Um, and I thought maybe you could just share a little about your experience on the project. And, and this was a real high point of your career at SOM and your career overall, but that's about the time you decided to leave SOM. Yeah, it was actually not the last project on my boards, but it was the last project that was finished. I mean, the interesting, interesting thing about working on large projects is they take a long time. And that project was won by competition. I didn't lead the competition, um, but I did work on some of the resolution in the final stages of whether they were gonna award it to our office or not. Um, but after it was won, I started the studio. So I fired up the studio, the design studio. Started with maybe three or four of us, which I was leading, and it grew to a team of be interesting to know the exact number on this, but in within SOM's office, it probably grew to 60 or 70, plus all the affiliated um, associate architects working with us. Again, you know, it's just hard. You look, in when you're in a big firm, you can't claim everything. You do see your thumbprints, and you see the thumbprints of your team. It's, you know, when I look at every project, I remember the person who said, why don't we try this, you know? And, and then we all look at them and, and we try and decide, okay, is this idea or is it that idea? We look at all of those ideas and very quickly kind of whittle it down. But it starts with somebody having a germ and um, encouraging everybody to bring a germ, uh, even if it can't have thick skin because you would just sit there and not do anything. But I think for me, the memorable thing, most memorable thing, the moment when I realized that when you look up at the ceiling of the International Terminal, you do not want to see a light source anywhere. And so how, therefore, do you light a 750-foot span truss? 
um, that's lacy and has skylights in it that James Carpenter ended up working with us in, in his um, uh, filtered, uh, crystallized, filtered um, diacrylic, I want to say, um, prismatic panels that are up there. Um, the big idea that I sort of remember is the day when we decided to put the lights on top of the ticketing uh, peninsulas. So on top of each and every one of the ticketing peninsulas, there are 360 um, fluorescent lights. They may be LED by now, but they're fl fluorescent lights, so you don't, you don't ever see them. And they shine up, and that's what illuminates the ceiling. And so there, there are lots of these things. You know, when you inherit a project, even if you weren't part of the competition, you definitely have the role of uh, adjusting that project or sometimes scrapping that because the client doesn't end up wanting to build what they chose you to build. What maybe they were doing was choosing the firm. And they're looking for that kind of leadership brought into the, the best design of the project. And you know, I'm looking back there at my old dear friend, Catherine Clark Albright, who was there with me in the room. <laughs> so all these years later, so as you'll see, I've stopped the cascade of images behind us because the next project I really think deserves a lot of attention. So you uh, left SOM and became a design partner at the firm, a DC-based firm, AI, which was ultimately acquired by Perkins and Will. But before that acquisition, you led a team for the competition for the August Wilson uh, Center, and if you don't know, August Wilson is a playwright who was born in Pittsburgh. So tell us about um, that, that, a little bit about that project. Yeah, that one. And this is what you're seeing on the screen now. Yeah, that one, I had left Skidmore. It was in the first maybe year or two when I was at the firm in DC, which ultimately was, um, uh, merged with Perkins and Will. Um, and I got invited to this international competition. You know, they sent out 100, you know, it was, it was everybody, you know, across the board, ethnicity, you know, really big names, not such big names. And long story short, you know, we, we made the short list, and then we made the very, very short list. <laughs> and Phil Freelon, my my late dear old friend yes. was on one, he was one of my main competitors. Now Phil was an excellent architect and he, mostly he was a great showman. And his wife, Nina Freelon, they would partner up in ways that just were unbeatable. <laughs> and so we go to Pittsburgh to present our, our proposals and it was kind of a public scenario and Phil comes in, Nina's there, and she's so wonderful and provocative, and I'm there with my team, and we were talking like architects. There was, there was no kind of drama about it. We were architects going to present a scheme, and Phil had a very good scheme, and he knew the building type. But he had set the stage for this thing, and I just, you know, we're all, my whole team were sitting there, you know, we're not gonna win this. And so we all give our presentations, we go home, and two weeks later, we learned that we, in fact, we won it. And I remember I was driving my five-year-old son to school, and I, I took a phone call while I was in the car, pulled over to the side, took the phone call. And um, I learned we won it. And I just screeched. I, just, <laughs> I think my kid now, he still remembers that. <laughs> but, you know, that was a moment where, for me, something all came together in, in that project. You know, the... The way we worked as a team, the fact that um, living in San Francisco on a, in a city where the grid intersects the main drag at 45 degrees, which is what happens in Pittsburgh, and you look at it and you say, you know, we could do a flat iron or we could do a dowel or we could do any, any number of things. I said, no, it just can't be that. You know, it's a block and a half from Vignoli's Convention Center. And so we're there, it's like two, three o'clock in the morning, trying to figure out what's gonna make this right. And you know, you're looking through books and trying to understand the history of black culture in Pittsburgh. And you know, there was just kind of a gesture that came after looking at some, uh, the Dahau ships that were responsible for carrying black culture eastward on the peninsula. And 
that for me, I wasn't thinking it was a ship's bow, but somehow there, it was the right gesture. It was directional. It was became an art piece, an urban art piece, and it became the thing off of which everything else flung. So it was in jeopardy all the time, you know, money-wise. But the biggest idea was about nailing the corner in that kind of um, manner in which people can decide what it looks like. But then the long facade along the north side, it's almost all glass, it's 400 feet long. And the sun hits it on a very few hours on June 21st. And I've been there a couple of times and just sat there and watched it till it came and then it went away. <laughs> it's just really cool. Um, and then the other side's real solid because that's where the Smithsonian level, level um, exhibits can be housed. So it's got this kind of very bright and very dark controlled kind of space about it. And August Wilson died while we were working on the project. Wow, and his family, that. yeah, it didn't start out to be that at all. He died and his family um, offered his name and, uh, and that changed the story altogether. It just suddenly became not just a downtown uh, cultural facility. It became the cultural place. And carrying his name, it became, um, actually they held the G20 there um, months after it was completed because it had the most uh, uh, elaborate and advanced ability to telecast uh, globally. So I still love this building. I go there now and then. And again, I'm sorry for being so manipulative of the slides, but I think <laughs> it's really important to see the building while yeah. she's talking about it. This is a postcard. Somebody, some, I found it online. Somebody took that and made it a postcard. So um, now you're at Perkins and Will. No, I'm not. Oh, yeah. That's right. We're in our story. I'm not at Perkinson. Well. So, right, remember creative <laughs> writing. I'm a writer. Yeah, yeah. I'm not just an architect. <laughs> Play a writer sometimes. Um, so there was another project that you did that I learned about through you, which was Create Singapore at Perkinson Well. And this was, of course, in Singapore. And this project is unique because it was one of the first or the first vertical lab, right? Lab buildings are usually these long, flat, three, four story, maybe buildings. And Create Sin Singapore is a tower. So I think it's really a great project to talk about that, this project. Uh, because it certainly was important for Phil Harrison, uh, who's the CEO of Perkins yeah. Will, still talking about it. Well, that's good. I mean, I, it's across the street from the, from the University of Singapore main campus. The big idea was to jump the freeway and to continue the research aspect of what was going on. Um, if I back up just for a minute, um, my firm AI um, merged with Perkins and Will, and the first thing that we did was acquire MBT. And along with MBT came this wealth of laboratory knowledge. And together we just had this really, really cool team of good architects who knew labs. And together we won this building in a competition. And I, I wouldn't say that there hadn't been a thought that there could be a high rise lab. Um, but I think the main thing that made us win this was there was a very clear lab module. It was about very narrow buildings daylight, and the lower buildings in the, in the assembly um, that we designed are very classic low buildings, four and five stories stepped up and embedded in the hill of green and the notion that the greenery from the hills kind of moves and becomes the underside of the, the buildings and it kind of flows into the central space. But I think the big move was taking that same module and turning it into a tower basically saying that the tower is really three of these bars that are kind of shifted past each other. And on the east side, they define uh, an area that then we voided the module um, and created these vertical gardens. And so that's an east-facing garden that is about uh, continuing the garden at the plaza up and growing and really kind of reigniting the flora and fauna. It becomes a morning garden. It's really a pleasant place to be. It's connected by a stair. I really think that's the thing that, that made it, you know, we didn't change the 
performance requirements. Very, very um, flexible space, day lit, uh, core is out of the way, so there's nothing stopping the modules you know, for the entire length of the bar. And I look at it, it always seems a little short to me because it's supposed to be another uh, probably four or six stories taller. But ultimately, that was one of the, at a point, you have to decide, okay, if it loses four or five stories, does that mean the, 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 uh, the idea doesn't work anymore? And for a while, it took me uh, just a little while to adjust the fact that it was short. It feels a little more plug-like than it was originally. But I think... I haven't been back there in a while. I suspect those gardens, as they're supposed to be completely now, um, enclosed by the vines um, to really create this interior uh, green room. Yeah, before we came into this room, we just were sitting and talking about the fact that a lot of times your idea, your design idea, the concept that you've worked for and you've advocated for isn't actually what gets built because there are huge compromises that are made along the way, including losing four stories. Yeah. <laughs> So more than any project included in my research, uh, the Health Sciences and Research Campus at the Princess Noor Aldurahman University for Women in Saudi Arabia visibly really for me expresses both, so if you didn't catch that in her bio, Allison was an artist first. Um, you've seen some of her sketches in this, and it's a very important part of how you express yourself as a designer, this ability to draw, this ability to, to um, express ideas with drawing. And it, you really see this in this building, that combination that you have of art and the expression of art and architecture. Yeah, so every building starts with a sketch. This is a sketch I remember making, sitting around a table with a client. You know, this project is for um, 40,000 Islamic women, but it's 30 million square feet, if you count everything. And so the piece for which I was responsible, pretty much what's on the screen now, um, really was for, it's the medical um, health sciences you know, nursing, dental, optometry, medical schools, which were just for women. And it was, it needed to be built really fast. The slide you're looking at right now, I actually built the SketchUp model that is demonstrated here. You had to find out what would be the module of the building that would um, embody all the traditional elements, you know, whether it be uh, courtyards, whether it be screens, whether it be shaped elements that are, um, regal or spiritual or religious, um, it became that module, which could be flipped, rotated, and uh, repeated. Um, this is one of those courtyards. Um, trying to figure out how that courtyard could truly function to be properly shaded, and in fact, ultimately, to expand its usable um, times of the year by three to four months, we invented the screen. And going on at the same time this was going on, were other campuses led by other teams. And actually, Sharon's husband was on my team um, at Skidmore. I didn't know that till recently. Uh, but, uh, you know, this became all about how to articulate in an artful way, how to let light into a space. So this is the library. If you back up one, I'm not sure you can. Yeah, so that pixelated thing um, is the outside of the wall is the second skin outside of this library space, which happens at each one of those modules, and it just kind of shimmers at night. And then there's another major screen element, which is on the breezeway there, which looks like this, which is a series of modules that are roughly four feet square. That I, this is my thumbprint here. I see it every time, and there's doodling, doodling, doodling. You know, what could you come up with that would be um, easily reproduced, um, that could be flipped and connected, but importantly in this case, in a, in a, in a um, square module, either you fill in the corners, you fill in half the corners, or you fill in none of the corners. And that increases the density, it increases the privacy, um, it increases the shade value. And um, you know, we began to look at that and use it. You know, it, it came about in search, we were in search of, because it is a university for women, and so much of the Islamic um, kind of geometry is very 
um, orthogonal, diagonal, uh, very rigid and s square, and um, seeking something that would satisfy that desire of the laciness and all. I've, I had a young man who happened to be from Egypt on my team, and at one moment I'm like doing this. I'm kind of a sketch-up queen, and I think my team always appreciated that. So I'm like working on this, and he looked over my shoulder. He says, now that, that looks Islamic. And he said, and it looks like it's for women. And I just wanted to kiss him, you know, it was like, <laughs> okay, I, I must be doing something right here, but we just used it and we used it. And what was ultimately the bottom line was this thing, this campus is huge. It's not like any of the other schools within the campus. Um, materials are humble, they're all local, but it's really for me all about the quality of shade and shadow and pattern that are elevated by, by this pattern, by these patterns that kind of move on to these humble materials, so. Another project from Perkins and Will is the Calexico port of entry along the U.S.-Mexico border. This was a GSA, a General Services Administration Design Excellence project, and uh, you, this was a really one where you articulated the middle ground between the U.S. and Mexico on that border condition really well. And I, we, we were talking, it's not exactly built the way it was intended, because these projects take forever. But uh, I thought maybe you wanted to share a little about that one. It was a huge, yeah. huge complex, right? Yeah, I think that along the border, the site was some um, 3,000 linear feet along the border. And Mexicality, Mexico has at the time over a million people. And Calexico, California, has 25. And so you can see it in all those aerial diagrams. But to win the project, we had to convince them that we understood what it meant to build in the desert. So, you know, cows are in the desert, you know, how to create shade and air movement, you know, the cliff dwellers figured out how to do it. It's really about positioning the overhang in a way that you leverage the, the sun and the shade. And it had to be about, for us, this pavilion building in the lower right-hand corner is kind of the icon to people coming through from the left, passing under this pavilion, which is glazed in, looking northward out into the town of Calexico, digging a deep hole on the north side so that the building embedded um, is shaded and it becomes part of the city. Now, unfortunately, it's not gonna look anything like this. I was telling Rebecca that <laughs> I learned recently that GSA, in order to get it built, has gone design build and lots of money taken out of it, a lot of things butchered by people who just never understood what the overall big ideas were. So I'm just gonna be happy from here on in, knowing that it won a PA award and it'll live in my mind that way. But um, this piece might get built. This, is, this one kind of catapults over a 50, it's a 50 foot cantilever over as the oversight for, um, for the patrol of the border and is an icon really at night, so hoping. I gotta tell you, hoping. in my graduate school, I got killed for a cantilever like that. I was just, the, they were like, that can never be done. Yeah. You can't do that. So anyway, I just like that. So let's quickly, the, at this point, you move from Perkins and Well to the mother of all huge firms, AECOM, which is big uh, E little A in the way it works, and did two more. Uh, GSA projects that are labs, and we're running low on time. I really want to show yeah, them your work now. So, if we so could, this can be a really short story. This could be the shortest story you tell. Because I didn't go, I was dragged into ACOM. I was trying to figure out what am I going to do, and it seemed like they should be able to do something really great with the access to great projects. So they recruited me, and the best things that came out of it were these two labs for NASA, one at Langley and one at Ames Moffett Field. And, you know, I like to look at these things in black and white because these are scientists, you know, who really want things to work and they really want to uh, feel that the buildings perform and that they have some meaning for them. So a laser um, uh, 
uh, scientists would certainly want a 400 foot long uninterrupted laser space, even though they were only asking for 48 feet. You know, the light bulb goes on, get all the core out of there and give them a really long space. And so, you know, this, this kind of barge of a building was a result. And then the one at Ames is similar. They ran out of money. Um, they were going to can the thing. The circulation was costing them money, but it's in California. You don't need to circulate in um, enclosed condition spaces. So I pulled the circulation path away from the labs and made this whole interactive space that became a civic gesture. And you know, so when I look back on those three and a half years, they weren't lost. I mean, you know, this is the Ames campus. All these wind tunnels. It's an amazing place. You know, the site is the red dot there, and it's 400 feet long. And you know, there was just, uh, it was important to command that entire length so that it became part of the civic heart. So you can begin to see this. This is a built photo. You can see the circulation's been pulled out. So one of the exits from the lab is onto that breezeway. And at the lower levels, it's out onto the, to the terrace. And then the, the, the bridge just kind of goes across there and encloses or defines an open space that gets used you know, all the time. And a, a very lacy kind of, um, uh, what's it called? <laughs> Airy. That, what, what's it called? I'm forgetting my words. Yeah, well, it's airy, but it's also like a brie soleil over the entire space. Anyway, so done. Very good, <laughs> thank you. Um, so um, I'm just going to keep it running, and we'll, I'm really uh, interested in, so my work only covered uh, Allison's career from her years at SO, well, at MBT, on through AECOM. Um, but it's really interesting to talk about what you are doing now. Yeah. So, you know, when you're in a firm and you're, or when you're practicing, you know, at least for me, it meant everything starts with a sketch. So you're going to draw and you're going to draw and you're going to redraw and you're going to just keep looking for where the inspiration is going to come from. Um, when I left big practice and my husband died um, seven and a half years ago, I was kind of pretty destroyed and I knew I needed to still practice. I decided I would wanted to protect myself, so it's like an umbrella um, that with just me under, under it, and I slowly dragged things back under there with me and felt protected and became a place to do all the things I'm doing. But one of the first things I did was to see what would happen if I just started drawing, started looking at what I saw when I'm not drawing an idea for a building. And so, I mean, we've all seen images like this, you know, where the trees kind of are fringes along the crest of a hill. And for me, it's still very architectural, but it's, it's very much about um, blocks of, of contrasting black and white and overlays of color, a la Aaron Douglas, a la Richard Motherwell, you know, Robert Motherwell, you know, things like that. So I'm still very inspired by that. I, my, my undergraduate degree was in printmaking. You know, this was my kitchen after raising two sons in a kitchen where having everything exposed so you could see if there were any, you know, kind of popcorn left or something. But one day that 100-year-old kitchen just needed to go, and so I decided I was going to redo it myself. I built a wood shop in my garage, and I ended up kind of building this whole thing by hand. I built the cabinets. I laid the floors. I did it all. I have a fake mother well over my sink. Mm -hmm. um, and I just streamlined it. And then the project snuck out into the next room. I removed a wall. I made my office. That's my office. Then I blew out the back wall with sliding doors that disappear. And then I built the deck. It was like it just kept going until I kind of ran out of space. And you know, it's really kind of where I live. And you know, these moments of thinking about what do you really want to do with your life, it's all about still being an architect, but toning it into the place. But I continue to have clients, you know, with my firm. I'm doing a project in Dallas, which is the Follies in a 14-acre park near the Texas Fairground. And it's all about shade and shadow and protection. So it's, it's really about small enclosed spaces under really expressive roofs. And these are just some early studies, plus a performance um, canopy that um, sits and confronts a lawn for 15,000 spectators. I was the bridge architect. Um, between Big and the A's, studying a new home for the Oakland A's, which died 
but I basically bridge the gap between architect and owner. And um, that was really terrific. I was there not for the ballpark, big design ballpark. I was there for the um, three or four million square feet of commercial space that needed to happen there. And so I wasn't really designing the buildings, but I was helping to imagine and um, apply some rigor to the, uh, the master plan as it related to this hub, new hub downtown. And then at some point I was approached by HDR, the big firm. They do a design excellence thing internally driven where they collect all the work and they, every three years, they, you'll stop that. Every three years they, um, they choose a, a jury chair and for three years in a row, uh, they formulate a jury. They associate with uh, an academic institution. Um, the first one was in LA somewhere and I, I'm sorry, I don't remember their name, but that was definitely on Zoom where all the work came you know, in a formatted arrangement critiqued by the jury made up of some well-known people and some, some well-known editors and writers. Um, so it was in LA one year, it was at Harvard the next year, and it was at um, uh, Cooper, Cooper Union in New York. Um, Aaron Betsky, <laughs> you saw him in the picture there. He was on the jury at Harvard. But it was really terrific. And after the first year of doing it, it became clear that I had some kind of affinity for the fact that they are an engineering, engineering firm. Um, that was trying to grow an architecture group. And man, they're doing a really good job. So if you ever get an opportunity to look at that firm, they're not just another big H hunk, you know, heavy handed place. They really have established a pretty good thing, but it, it seemed like we just liked each other. You know, they're a global guy and, and, and me, we just got along and he asked me, well, should we maybe go after competition together? So we did and we won it. Um, I can't talk about it, but I was told I could use a few of the slides. We're in the middle of, we're at the beginning of schematics now. But if you back up again, I mean, for me, the thing is, you know, it's really about an iterative project process. You start out with seven ideas, you choose one, that one spawns other ideas, then the client makes you say, well, we like the idea you came up with, but give us two more just to compare it to, and then you convince them that the first one was really the right one to do. And then, so now you're working with the one that you kind of, have had to adjust for lots of programmatic and, and economic reasons, but the process of working with them, what I'm showing you here is a few selected images from the competition. It's like half, um, half a billion, half a million square feet, uh, $500 million, half a billion dollars of quantum engineering laboratory. And I can't tell you where, but the idea was about lifting it up, getting some continuity of the ground plane, um, really thinking about, you know, a high rise, Chicago, a high rise, you know, tilted on its side, you know, expressive of the structure and establishing a, a main frontage along a really important spot along the university, which is also uh, a major urban thoroughfare. So that's what I'm doing now. The Dallas project, um, the confidential project, doing things like this. I lectured in Baton Rouge two weeks ago and teach at Stanford. They just finished their quarter and, you know, just enjoying life, traveling. Well, I think it would be really nice. We only, we actually are just a little over time, but before we go into Q&A, if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself personally. Okay, so you, te okay, all right, so, all right, so it occurs to me that we arrive at a point in our lives and we don't often think about why, you know, you're nobody, you don't choose your parents, you don't choose your heritage. I feel really, really lucky. And I think Rebecca has caused me to think about my parents in the equation of not only um, who I am now, but what I was, what they brought to it. You know, what I leave on the earth, my two best projects in the world are my sons, 29 and 31. And, you know, and most importantly, I got married two weeks ago and, <laughs> So this is like my latest project, hopefully not my most difficult one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's going to be. So. so I think we want to open it up for questions. Questions. questions? Uh, 
Uh, first and foremost, I want to say thank you, uh, Ms. Williams and Ms. Edmonds, for visiting and speaking with us here today. Um, my question is, how do you view the transition or the fissures, I, I suppose, between uh, firm to firm, in a sense, and how that sort of translates the knowledge that you've gained from one firm into placing it into moving forward in your work going forward? Um, I suppose a follow-up question to that is, which transition was the most difficult or in terms of your personal ideals and how you might have to change or adopt something new? Well, I think it's true you take it with you. So, I mean, when you're in a place, you're, you're there to learn everything that you can. I think there's subtext, though. I mean, I would have been very happy if Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill had decided that they wanted me to be a design partner. They couldn't get there. It's, it's not like they said they couldn't get there, but their actions were suggesting that they couldn't. And, <laughs> and so um, I was 45 years old, and I didn't really want to leave. Um, I had some concern about what would happen if I left, but I just knew that the part of me that was about leadership, did not control, but leadership, and wanting to make sure that I wasn't working in somebody else's box who had already decided um, that I didn't belong there. I mean, it was the only female, the only female, we're not even talking about race, the only female associate partner in design. And I don't think it's much better now. Um, it just occurred to me that you have to take your stuff and move it forward. So you have to know who you are and you have to know what you're good at. You have to know what your weaknesses are. You need to know who to collect around you. And you look for opportunities where um, you believe you have something to offer. And you, I think that the hardest thing, particularly for women maybe, is stepping into a place where they need you there because you're a woman. I mean, I avoid those things like the plague. I mean, it's almost like you want to put a bag over your entire body and show them your portfolio so that there isn't anything that gives them a clue who you are. It's like, because ultimately that's, that's what you have to be to walk through this profession. I think that was true then, it's maybe less true now, but I think it's still true. It's just probably true for every, everybody. I mean, you don't present um, who you are, you show them what you can do. And you don't talk about who you are or where you came from, you show them what you can do. And the disadvantage that any of us have because our skin is a certain color or we're a certain race, that's disadvantage, but the minute you let that overwhelm you, you're in trouble. So I think just, you know, the advice would just be know what you have to offer, know your strengths, try and improve your, your, your shortfalls, but you can't be good at everything. It's okay to be good at, really good at something. Not cocky good, but just know that you're, this is what you do and make that a platform not that you tell everybody what you can do, but you continue to evolve on that platform. And you, you surround yourself with people that you like to work with. I'd also like to answer part of that question because I teach um, emerging leaders in architecture. I also teach uh, writing at Morgan State University. And I always remind young people as they're getting ready to move from academia into practice to really know their point of view. Right? Remember why you came to this profession and what you wanted to do within it. And write it down. Like, I know, I'm a writer, right? But write it down and keep it with you and use it to help you make decisions as you move through your career. Staying true to that and then growing that with the, by taking advantage of the things that Allison is talking about, finding that next place to expand what it is you want to do. And of course it can change why you're here, why you're doing this. But staying true to that core, what I call your point of view, is really essential when you, when you kick off in this career. Thanks. Um, yeah, it's such an excellent conversation. I'm so happy that I have been able to learn about your work and hear, hear all of this fantastic. Um, I just wanted to kind of return to the, the statement that you kind of started out with, this idea that you, that you um, 
um, Allison, you know, didn't want to be kind of interviewed or, you know, to talk about your work as a, as a black architect or a woman architect. And I, I mean, I totally understand that, you know, architecture is about kind of expertise and aesthetics and, you know, design abilities. And, you know, of course, that's what we're all judged on. And yet, you know, we, we do go through the world <laughs> with our identities, and those identities absolutely do shape the way that people interact with us. I mean, it's sort of inescapable. And, um, and that doesn't have to be a negative, right? I mean, there's a way in which, you know, in, in my kind of professional experience, you know, many years ago, it was a huge benefit to be a woman, to relate to women clients, and, you know, to be able to interact with them in a certain way. And I guess I'm curious whether or not, you know, there were moments in your career in which, you know, various aspects of your identity was, you know, beneficial. I, you know, I'd be lying if I said, no, I don't think, I, I, absolutely. You know, I think I just feel like I'm glad I had what it took to make good on whatever kind of false assumption or kind of uh, partial assumption. Like, you know, certainly, I, I know I was in the room sometimes. You know, and you always wonder, Am I in this room because they need me in this room? You know, but you can't, I mean, even now, today, you know, I, I actually, if someone calls me and in the first two sentences, if they say anything about needing to partner with a black architect, it's like, it's over. It's over, you know, and also don't invite me to come speak in the month of February. Just don't, you know, invite me some other month, you know. <laughs> But, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it's fair to say that certain opportunities come to you because of the way that you are identified. I think that there's good in that and there's bad in that. There's what you do with the opportunity when you're in that room. And if you use that identity as a crutch and you don't take it as just an amazing opportunity that you're going to work yourself on top of and climb above and then take it and move on, then you've done yourself a disservice. But I, I think that kind of contradicts with what I just said about avoiding certain projects, but I think I'm past that point. I guess this advice would be to someone in the early parts of their career where just about everything is a, should be seen as a good opportunity. I mean, it, it's how you take it and how you embellish it and how you show yourself um, that you can do so much more than you ever believed you could. Like in doing my kitchen at home, I'd never done anything smaller than 45,000 square feet. <laughs> I'd, never, I'd never drawn a cabinet, you know? <laughs> you know, so it's, everything's good. Yeah, and this isn't the first person, like in history, in, in sort of doing this research, I went all the way back to the first woman architect licensed in New York State, Louise uh, Bethune. Right, and she had that, it, you know, here we are in the late 1800s, and she had that same attitude. Don't, and she ran into problems with it more than she ran into benefits from it, uh, because at that time, women could do, you know, and for most of the first half uh, of the uh, 20th century, women did, could do homes and kitchens and things like that, but she fought that and did institutional work, but she didn't want to be, she wanted to be an architect first. That was her lens. and. You know, in my research, I quote a number of women throughout history who have used that, uh, that idea to empower them within this, this profession, to not let it limit them or define them is probably a better word. And I just want to say there are a lot of men in this room. And I, there's a discomfort I often feel when there are men in the room that when we talk about being female architects, I think we talk about it because we feel like other than what the profession typically describes as being an architect. But you know, there are gentle men. There are men who are very cerebral. They don't talk a lot. They don't, um, they don't, they don't portray these giant egos. And I think in a big firm setting, you know, it can be just about as problematic for them if, if we're talking about a firm setting, it can be just about as problematic for them as it can for someone who clearly identifies as being other, you know, of another race, another gender. And so, you know, I think a lot of the value in, in you guys being in the room um, is not just to hear this kind of conversation. It's also that 
I think the advice that I offer actually often, um, and, and the people that I know I've brought mentorship to, they're not all women. So, important. I will tell you quickly that if I, I play around with whatever I get my hands on, but if you plug architect into any image generating, AI image generator, they're gonna pop up with a guy. It is pretty fascinating. And you can put in diversity and the guy will get older or the guy will get younger. <laughs> it's pretty fascinating. So there's an algorithm out there that needs to be a little changed. So. <laughs> That's funny. Thank you for your lecture. My question is regarding the making of an architect. I'd like to know, for both of you please, who has been your inspiration among the old masters and your contemporaries? You go first. Um, I think the really the only, you know, it's easier for me to tell you who kind of graded on me. <laughs> like the writings of Stephen Hall have just absolutely <laughs> almost driven me insane. But I would say Luis Barragan to me was really the most inspiring architect. Um, just I, and I visited many of his projects in Mexico, and his ability to stop you in the moment and make you be in that place that he created, and you are nowhere else but in that place, and being in that place is wonderful. And to me, that is the essence of what we as architects can do, is to be able to come together, to bring together everything that we are forced to know in this profession, which is a lot, right? Everybody's a lot. And be able to come together and create a space where in that moment, that person is truly there. So that, that's my answer. Okay, Louis Kahn, Scarpa, Corbusier. I think about them all the time when I'm working. But, you know, I also, you know, my father was, was not an architect, he was, he built her house in Cleveland, but I have three sisters and I was the one who ended up getting the genes from him. That is, you build it, you draw it, you hammer it, you break it, you put it back together, you know, you break it again. You know, these kind of things it's about making, it's about constantly using your hands to create or recreate stuff. And so I'd have to say my dad was huge and, um, I never felt like there was any reason why I couldn't do just about anything I wanted to do, gender not specific. So. And I think one thing to be important, one thing also I discovered in this research is that people who inspire you in architecture don't need to be architects. Yeah. You can look, your father, other people in your world, other people you encounter, other things that inspire you. It doesn't have to come from architecture and often it's better if it doesn't come from architecture. Thank you so much. It's 3.16. We're one minute past our allotted time. Uh, thank you all for joining us, and thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. So a reminder, tomorrow, 1.30, in the library in Kogel, we're going to continue the conversation and Q&A in, in a more informal way. And then at 3 o'clock in the lobby, we're going to have the um, gallery talk for the one-by-one one Argentina. But thank you so much again. Thank you.